Good morning. My name is Dr. David Sandberg. I'm the Director of Pediatric Neurosurgery at McGovern Medical School in UT Health. My clinical practice is at Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital, and I also take care of brain tumor patients at MD Anderson Cancer Center. I'm giving this webinar on arachnoid cysts for the educational benefit of patients and families because there's so much confusion about this disease entity in terms of who needs treatment, what's the ideal treatment, et cetera. So here we go. Let's start with what are arachnoid cysts. Arachnoid cysts are benign, non-neoplastic, meaning they're not cancer, they're not tumors, um, lesions that occur in the brain. As you can see in the CT image on the right, there's a big cyst in the brain. 75% of these are diagnosed in childhood, but they can be diagnosed anytime and sometimes are found incidentally in adults after car accidents or when patients get imaging studies for a variety of reasons. There's a male predominance, three to one. We don't know why. The most common location is the middle cranial fossa, which is the location of this cyst as shown in the CT scan on the right side. <clears throat> the cause of arachnoid cysts in general is unknown. Most are considered congenital in nature. They start early in childhood. What they're made of is fluid that has a cyst wall around it. The cyst wall is composed of a thin, wispy tissue called arachnoid, which is part of the leptomeninges, the coverings of the brain. And I'll show you pictures of that. The cyst is filled with clear fluid, which most assume is chemically indistinguishable from cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, which is the fluid produced by the brain that circulates around the brain. We actually did a study when I was a fellow many years ago in which we found that it is similar to CSF, except it has much higher protein content. The significance of that is not determined. So I want to emphasize that most arachnoid cysts don't need surgical treatment. It always creates panic when you are told that your child has a lesion, any lesion in the brain, oh my God, what does this mean? Is it gonna affect him or her? Is it gonna grow? Is it gonna need surgery? What are the risks? So parents obviously you know, are concerned when they get an MRI report that shows anything but normal. But I wanna emphasize that most arachnoid cysts are small, asymptomatic, and will never need treatment. Others can start out small and expand. There is no accurate way of predicting which arachnoid cysts will remain stable over time and which will expand, but it is worth noting that most arachnoid cyst growth occurs in younger children, especially babies. We talk about children under the age of four need to be watched a little more closely. Older children, their cysts rarely grow or change significantly. And here at the bottom are two examples of small arachnoid cysts that came, you know, patients who came to see me with these cysts that did not need treatment. This is a small middle cranial fossa arachnoid cyst um, incidentally found, and this is a small arachnoid cyst in the cerebellar pontine angle, neither of which needed treatment. And, you know, how often should we obtain imaging studies to make sure these are stable? That's an unknown question, which is why I put the question marks, and it's part of the art of medicine. Um, for me, I tend to get imaging studies more frequently in younger patients for the reasons which I explained, and in older patients um, less frequently. I want to, this talk is not about pineal region cysts, but I want to briefly mention <clears throat> pineal region cysts <clears throat> because it is a cystic lesion of the brain, um, and we get so many patients with concerns about pineal region cysts. Pineal region cysts are found in 1.8% of the population, and so, you know, if you took, it's, that's almost one in 50 individuals. So if you took somebody off the street and stuck them in an MRI scanner, one in 50 of them almost will have a pineal region cyst. And this is a pineal region cyst in the center of the brain in the pineal region. And these in general are very unlikely to grow or cause symptoms. The overwhelming majority do not need treatment and they are of no consequence. For a typical appearing pineal region cyst, I do not repeat imaging studies at all in my practice. So <clears throat> I want to emphasize that most arachnoid cysts are small and don't need treatment, but particularly in very young patients, you have to be very careful about telling a family that it's not going to ever change or grow or cause symptoms. This is kind of an extreme example. A patient at the age of three months 
um, of age who got an MRI for unclear reasons, uh, maybe developmental concern. And at first glance, the MRI looks normal, but there's this tiny cyst in the medial temporal lobe um, in the middle cranial fossa. This is the smallest, wimpiest cyst you've ever seen. So the family was told this is nothing to worry about. And then slowly the baby's head started to grow much bigger than one would expect. They didn't get another imaging study for a while because they were reassured by this MRI, which was essentially normal. But that little cyst became this massive cyst that was pressing on the brain and shifting over the brain, um, huge uh, middle cranial fossa cyst in an MRI that was obtained one year later um, for persistent health, head growth way above the um, normal percentiles. So we performed a surgery to pop holes in the cyst. We'll talk a little bit more about the surgeries for these cysts later. This is six weeks after surgery. The cyst is dramatically smaller. There's still a lot of fluid around the surface of the brain. And one year later, the brain has re-expanded and the cyst almost doesn't exist. This is something that only happens in young children. In older children, the brain is not going to expand like this, but this is a dramatic um, presentation and a dramatically positive result. So in general, you know, I mentioned that most arachnoid cysts don't need surgery, but there are some that surgery should be considered. In general, surgery should be considered for arachnoid cysts that have significant mass effect on the brain, that are shifting the brain over, like this cyst that's shown on the right side of the screen. Patients who are very young, who have a full fontanelle or soft spot, or an abnormally increasing head circumference in infants, like the patient I just showed you. Signs and symptoms of elevated intracranial pressure, objective neurological findings. Most patients who are older present with headaches, but there are a variety of symptoms that can be accompanied and, I'll, and signs, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. And here's that list of symptoms that can be associated. There are case reports in the medical literature and or retrospective reviews of patients who've had post-operative improvement or resolution of many signs and symptoms, many of which are objective. So subjectively headaches, but seizures, papilledema, increased swelling in the optic nerves, a variety of cranial nerve palsies, hemifacial spasm, cognitive and mental health issues, uh, developmental delay, language delay, Chiari malformation, syrinx, which is fluid within the spinal cord, hydrocephalus, nystagmus, jerking of the eyes, exophthalmos, where the eyes push out, or precocious puberty. So a whole variety of things that arachnoid cysts can be associated with that surgery can improve in the right patient. There is also a recent report showing that there is objective neuropsychological improvement after treatment of arachnoid cysts. This was for middle fossa cysts, the most common arachnoid cyst, and a variety of children underwent a surgery for arachnoid cysts deemed to be symptomatic. They had neuropsychological testing preoperatively and postoperatively. Interestingly, preoperatively, a high percentage of them had learning difficulties, cognitive difficulties, mood or behavior disorders. And on the Wechsler intelligence scale, a standard uh, intelligence scale, the entire cohort dramatically improved um, in terms of IQ and other measures. And some of them had a very significant um, improvement in, their, in these indices. Additionally, subjective improvements in learning and behavior were reported by 97% of parents. There can be a placebo effect with surgery, so that can explain some of this. Um, but I think this data is, is, is actually very compelling. People ask about bleeding into arachnoid cysts. There have been reports of bleeds into arachnoid cysts, and I have seen this, where patients after relatively minor trauma have had bleeding into cysts, which can be life-threatening. The bigger the cyst, I think the more likely that this happens. And we can have a whole discussion about you know, what's appropriate in terms of sports participation. Um, you know, I think the most important thing is safety precautions, having the parents drive carefully, having the child drive carefully when they become a, a, a teenage driver, um, helmet use with, with um, every time a child gets on a bicycle or an ATV, um, et cetera. Surgical options. So once we have deemed that a patient has an arachnoid cyst, which is large, which is causing symptoms, there are various options for surgery. And there are three main options. One is putting in a shunt, and we'll talk about that. The other is a craniotomy for fenestration. That's where you take off a piece of the skull, put it back at the end of the surgery. And fenestration just means popping holes in different sides. I tell families, it's like you have a balloon. If you pop a hole in one side of the balloon, 
the balloon can inflate again. But if you pop, pop holes in multiple sides of the balloon, even if you try to infuse fluid into that balloon, it's not going to inflate anymore. And endoscopic fenestration, which we love doing when we can, which is minimally invasive, an endoscope is a small camera where we go in with a camera and pop holes in the cyst and accomplish the same thing as we do with a craniotomy. So this is an example of shunting. We call it a cyst to peritoneal shunt. Peritoneum is the abdomen. Um, this is a huge arachnoid cyst in a baby who presented with macrocephaly, which is an enlarged head. I chose to put a shunt in. It's my least favorite operation to do for these cysts because there was no place to actually fenestrate to. We could pop holes in the outer membrane of the cyst, but I didn't see a good place to pop holes on the inner membrane on the other side of that balloon. And so I thought shunting was the best thing to do. And this is postoperatively. We have a shunt in place and the brain has dramatically expanded to fill the skull and the macrocephaly normalized. So a very effective procedure in the right patient. And so you might ask, you know, if you can get results like this with a shunt, you know, why not just shunt every patient? And the answer is that shunts have a very high failure rate. There's a 30 to 45% failure rate in the first year. Here's a couple complications from shunts I've seen in my practice. The shunt eroding through the skin in a baby with a very thin scalp, a disconnection of the shunt, and there are so many others. And there's a four to 5% failure rate per year after the first year of shunt placement. And in the medical literature, it's lower at our institution, but there's a five to 10% infection rate. So the complication rates with shunts are real. And I tell families, you know, putting in a shunt is a lifelong commitment. And it's like your car or your air conditioner it can work, you know, temporarily. And then at a moment's notice, it just stops working and has a problem. And so shunts can be life-saving and they can also be very problematic. So we try to avoid shunts with fenestrations. One option, as I mentioned, is a craniotomy for open fenestration. You can make a relatively small incision, as you can see in this child um, on the right with the large cyst. We can make a relatively small incision. We take off a piece of bone. We open the dura, which is the covering of the brain. And this is the arachnoid. It's that thin, wispy membrane, which forms the outer membrane of the cyst. And you can see there's often little blood vessels in it. So we coagulate it, and meaning we burn the, the edges of it. It has no function and cut out the outer membrane. But that's not the important part. The important part is going in with a microscope and making a hole on the opposite side of that membrane to communicate it with the cisterns, which are the spaces around the most deep portions of the brain so that the balloon can't fill up again. Here's an example of um, a craniotomy for a fenestration of an arachnoid cyst in a different region. This was a three-year-old boy. An MRI was obtained after a cyst was found incidentally on a CT scan after a fall. This is a relatively small cyst, and I elected to watch this. To, I didn't think the patient needed surgery, but we repeated an MRI one year later, and the cyst had grown. As I told you, younger children, it's more likely to grow, and now it was bigger. It would have extended higher, it extended lower, and it was shifting over the brainstem. And the natural history, once this starts, is they tend to keep growing. And I didn't want to wait till this child had a problem. And so we performed a craniotomy. We took off a piece of bone, we made an incision in the back of the head, popped a bunch of holes in the cyst. This is one month after surgery. In the third picture and in the fourth picture, five years postoperatively, the brainstem is back to the normal position. The cyst is very small, and we would expect that it would remain this way for the rest of this child's life, and the child is neurologically normal and leading a great life. So the final option is neuroendoscopy. As mentioned, minimally invasive fenestration or popping of a hole in the cyst. This picture on the left is a picture of an endoscope, which is a camera, a small camera, which has uh, working channels, which you can put into the brain. Here's an example of a team putting in an endoscope into the brain, and you can see what's going on on the television monitor. An example of a cyst that we thought was best for an endoscopic fenestration, a seven-month-old girl who presented with macrocephaly, that's an enlarged head. The head was greater than the 98th percentile on the growth curve, and a full fontanelle or soft spot. You can see she has massive hydrocephalus. The ventricles are extremely enlarged on the picture on the left. And on the picture on the right, you can see that the reason for that enlargement is a large cyst <clears throat> filling the supracellar space, the space above the cella tersica where the pituitary gland lives, we can go in with an endoscope into the lateral ventricle and pop holes in both sides of the cyst. Here's the outer membrane at the foramen of Monroe, which is the junction of the lateral ventricle and the third ventricle. You can see the cyst membrane 
with the little blood vessels in it. We burn those little blood vessels and pop multiple holes in that cyst. And then on the other side of the membrane, we pop holes and we visualize the basilar artery branching out into the two posterior cerebral arteries. And we've popped holes in that cyst so it shouldn't re-expand. Here's before surgery on the left. The middle picture is one year after surgery. The ventricles are smaller. This is two years after surgery. The ventricles are even smaller. The brain looks normal. And the result is we have a neurologically normal child with greater than five years of follow-up who's doing wonderfully. Here's an example of an endoscopic fenestration, um, a large middle fossa cyst in a four-year-old who presented with language delay. And you know, for those of you who aren't squeamish, I'll show a brief intraoperative video so we've made a very small incision, and we've made a small hole in the outer membrane of the cyst. Now, with a variety of instruments, we're popping holes in the middle part of the cyst, the part towards the midline, and you see the membrane flapping in the breeze. We use a variety of instruments with our endoscope. This is a balloon to expand the openings so they don't seal over. And you can see. We're dilating those openings as much as we can. And look at that pulsation of the brain as fluid is forced through the cyst. We can use a bimanual technique using both hands to lift up pieces of the arachnoid away from blood vessels. That's the middle cerebral artery. We're looking at a very important vessel in the brain. We're very cautious, obviously, to cut the arachnoid and leave that vessel alone. And you can see we've created large holes in this membrane. That's the optic nerve we're looking at, which controls vision. And we're creating holes in different spaces. These are technically challenging operations, but we do these all the time. And the results in general are great. And the advantage is it's a small incision we only do it when patients are good candidates anatomically. Um, you know, minimally invasive is not necessarily minimally risky, and we pick the best operation for each patient. And this is before surgery for that patient. This is after surgery. The cyst is much smaller. The brain has re-expanded. There's a little fluid on the other side not causing any problems, and the patient did well neurologically. Here's another example of an endoscopic fenestration. An MRI was obtained at birth because of an in utero diagnosis of a brain cyst on prenatal ultrasounds. The head circumference was normal. The fontanelle of the soft spot was soft. So we observed it with serial imaging. At two months of age, the soft spot was getting fuller but, and the cyst was growing and the ventricles were enlarged. So we made a small incision and popped an endoscope into the lateral ventricle and popped holes in this cyst. And this is seven years of follow-up with the cyst never re-expanding, the ventricle smaller, and the patient did great neurologically. So in conclusion of this webinar, most arachnoid cysts, I want to emphasize, do not need surgery or any other treatment. For every 10 patients who come to my office with, a, with an arachnoid cyst, eight or nine of them don't need surgery and one or two of them do. And those are the ones that make it to my office. Many others with very small cysts, you know, don't even need referrals. For arachnoid cysts that are requiring surgery, the options include shunting, open fenestration via craniotomy, and minimally invasive endoscopic treatment. And the majority of patients with arachnoid cysts have great outcomes. I want to thank you for your attention, and our team is delighted to see any patients with this or other pediatric neurosurgical diagnosis, and the phone number is listed here on the last slide. Many thanks.